the matrix has to be symmetric and x transpose a n x must be greater than or equal to 0 for all uh, x in R n. And so if a n converges to a, would x transpose a x also be greater than or equal to 0? Uh, yes, because each point in the sequence is greater than or equal to 0, so the limit will also be greater than or equal to 0. So that's basically the proof. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, my bad. Okay, uh, but this is the definition of a closed set. So a set is closed if you pick a sequence in the set X and the sequence converges to some point, then that point should also belong to X. Okay. And uh, for positive definite matrices, a matrix is positive definite if it is, if it is symmetric and X transpose matrix x is greater than or equal to 0 for all x in Rn. So these are the two. You're just playing with three definitions here. I'm going to erase it and hope that nobody has noted it down. <laughs> OK. Uh, oh, uh, yes, question? It always makes it easier if you split a problem into two separate problems, but I don't know what context you're talking about. Juice problem? So Juice problem? In the homework, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the problem number three you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. So what? how do you want to split it? Yeah. Uh, for one of the Juice one and Juice two. Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so Juice problem, the trick is to define x a one x a 2, x b 1, x b 2, and then you just mix the two juices uh, together. So you have to introduce four new variables in order to solve the problem. And then it will become a linear problem. So you can just solve it uh, using MATLAB. Okay. So never be afraid of introducing variables. Okay. Uh, I wanted to uh, talk about the project. So you know the project is due on December 2nd. Uh, the, the reason why this course has a project is because we have students all the way from undergrad to PhD level students in this class. And, uh, and, and in the past, I mean not in the past, I, I'm sure even in this class, we have students from mechanical, aerospace, civil, electrical, from undergrad all the way to PhD. Okay, so. Uh, this is like a truly interdisciplinary class, and it's difficult to judge every student's performance based on just assignments and whatever exams, because those are uh, pretty theoretical. Sorry about that. Uh, but it, they are pretty theoretical uh, for this class. So the reason why we have project is so that, so it has multiple things. So one thing is you can showcase your skills in optimization using your project. So that's very good. Uh, project is about 30% of not, yeah, it's about 30% of the grade. So it's a substantial portion of uh, the total marks. And uh, uh, if you do very well in the project, you will get 30 out of 30. So you know that's a very good thing to have. Um, one of the things that I always suggest to students is if you want to pick a topic for project, you pick it based on where you want to work in the future. So if you are Planning to work in automotive company, you should pick a project that is related to optimization in automotive systems. If you plan to work in some civil engineering company, you pick optimization problem for a civil engineering based problem. So just pick a problem that is suited to your future interest so that you can write it in your resume, you can brag about it in job interviews. <laughs> and uh, make sure you do a good job in uh, doing the simulation or uh, reading some sort of papers and understanding the theory behind what's the topic of study in that particular paper. So in the past, people have looked at uh, uh, water sewage treatment plant optimization in some sewage treatment plant stuff. So that was a civil engineering student. Uh, some students who were more uh, who were into PhD in electrical engineering, they were looking at uh, optimization in wireless networks um, or control systems. Then there were students from mechanical who have always uh, 
been very interested in automotive systems and you know battery sizing, battery pack optimization, battery uh, control, you know things. Uh, so so questions of that nature, and then they uh, study those optimization problems in their project. Some students choose to actually implement algorithms. So instead of doing a more theoretical project because it's not suited to their interest, uh, they would actually implement a complicated optimization algorithm in their project. So that's their project, and then they will have lots of simulation diagrams um, in their project report. So that's why I'm keeping the format of the project pretty open because I want you to showcase uh, why you are interested in optimization and what's the problem that. Uh, uh, you are interested in how are you planning to solve it? What are the results you are getting once you solve that optimization problem? So if you are more, uh, if you have more interest in theory like me, you do a theoretical. You just pick some random optimization paper and just uh, just read it cover to cover and write about that theory. Or if you are more of an applications person, you pick an application, run some simulations, and write in the report whatever. What's the formulation? What's the simulation result? What did you observe in your simulation? So, um, so please consider taking your project seriously. And the reports are due on December second, and that's pretty much the last assignment for this class. Okay. Uh, any questions about the project? You have to write a three plus page report. So, font size eleven. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So three plus page report. I don't. Don't make it 25 pages. Once somebody, some student submitted me a project which was 48 pages long. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, most of the pages were just big figures, OK? So like 20 pages was one MATLAB figure, then one MATLAB figure, then one MATLAB figure. But don't do something like that. You know, Just make it reasonable so I can grade it in, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, not, not write a 48-page report. Uh, anyways, so. Uh, any questions on the project? Do we have presentations? Do you have? Do we have presentations for the project? Presentation, no, no. Okay, uh, we were talking about penalty approach for optimization. I want to minimize fx such that h of x is equal to 0, g of x less than or equal to 0. I transform this problem into an unconstrained optimization problem where I want to minimize fx plus cpx, c greater than 0 sufficiently large. And P of X was max of zero G one of X, G R of X, H one to H M minus H one to minus H M. Okay, all of these are functions of x. Okay, and the problem is because of this maximum operation over multiple functions. Uh, the objective function here is not differentiable. So fx plus cpx is not differentiable. Uh, and the question is, how do we solve this optimization problem? Okay, what we have shown so far is if x star is a solution to this problem, then x star is also a solution to this problem. Okay, uh, in particular, if x star is a local minimum to this problem, then x star is a local minimum for this unconstrained optimization problem. Um, 
Okay. However, solution to this minimization problem need not be a solution to the original problem that we started with. Um, but my personal feeling is those would be, um, such cases would be rare. Uh, and you will have to come up with pathological examples where that would be the case. But that's my feeling. I, I, there's no formal proof about it. OK. Now the question is, how do we solve this uh, problem, which is not different? The objective function is not differentiable. So let's go back to the basics. We want to find a direction d to descend in. What should the property of direction d be? Should be less than fx plus c px. Okay, that clear? Let's look at the expression for fx plus t plus c px plus d. Uh, uh, let's assume that we only have inequality constraints. I'm going to drop these terms uh, because I can split hx as hx less than or equal to 0 and hx greater than or equal to 0. So let's just, or minus hx less than or equal to 0. Since that, since doing this operation or splitting an equality constraint into two inequality constraint is allowed here, uh, let's just assume that we ha only have inequality constraints uh, because we can split this into a sequence of inequality constraints. So assume only inequality constraints. This is just to simplify the notation, nothing else. OK. Uh, this is fx plus gradient fx transpose d plus o norm of d. So that's the first order Taylor series expansion for the function f plus c max of gj of x plus gradient gj of x transpose d plus O norm of D, this is max over J and zero. Okay, this zero came from the zero here and the rest of it is just the first order Taylor expansion of GJ. Okay, and we have an equality here. So I can collect all these uh, OD term outside. And there is something else that's happening here. So let's look at the diagram. So I have fx plus cpx. This is my x. Let me draw the function this way. This is f plus c g1. This is f plus c g2. f plus c g3.
what is fx plus cpx? It's the max of these three functions. Okay. So since it's a max of these three functions, it is the upper envelope of these functions. Okay, so this pink pink line uh, shows what the function f plus cp is. Okay, yes. Um, how do you take the gradient inside the max? Uh, I mean, so I'm I'm. This is the max of g1 to gr, right? So g1 of x plus d is g1 x plus gradient g1 transpose d plus o norm of d right so i'm not taking the max inside i'm just uh, expanding the expression yes right Uh, I think that's the right question to ask. So yes, I think it will violate the regularity constraint for this optimization problem, but not for this original optimization problem you started with. Okay. Um, there are some other Necessary conditions for optimality does, doesn't require regularity. We didn't cover those theorems in this class. Okay, so definitely those conditions would be satisfied, even if you made this change. Okay. Um, remember that the reason why I'm splitting it is purely for notational reason, not for I'm not changing the underlying theory behind it. Okay, I just don't want to carry all the h1 to hm and minus h1 to hm in my max function. That's the only reason. Okay. Uh, all right. So coming back to this, uh, this is my function f plus cg1. Okay, that looks like this. F plus cg2 looks like this. F plus cg3 looks like this. I'm taking the max of all these three functions. So that's going to be the upper envelope of these three functions, uh, and that's f plus cp. Now, I pick a point x here, and I move in the direction. This is my x plus d, and this is my x minus d. My question is, uh, if these d is sufficiently small, would this constraint become active, which is g1 become active in the max uh, of these uh, three equations? So remember, I'm at this point at which g2 is active and g3 is active, but g1 is not active. Okay, and I'm moving slightly in the positive or negative direction here. So I'm going from x to x plus d, where d could take a positive or negative value. And my question is whether this function would become active if I just take a small step in any direction. No, right? Because as you can see, this function will only become active if you take a very long step and if you reach this point. But for small steps, this function remains inactive, and only these two functions participate in changing the shape of f plus cp. Okay, so that leads us to define the following set j of x, which is the set of j such that g j of x is equal to p x. Uh, yeah. 
So I'm, I'm, at, I'm standing at x and I want to look at the values of gj that actually drives the penalty. And I'm going to ignore other values of gj's that do not drive the penalty. That does not affect the penalty at that particular point x. Okay, so in this case, j of x is 2 and 3. Okay, so 1 is not active at this particular point. <coughs> okay, I'm also going to define g0 of x as the zero function uh, so that's this function, uh, this function right here. So that my p of x becomes uh, max of g0, g1, all the way up to gr. And I'm going to include 0 in this uh, inequality. So how should I write it? Uh, yeah, I know how to write it. j in 0 to r such that gj of x is equal to p of x. Okay. So this is the set of all indices such that those indices are active at that particular point. It, it contributes to the penalty function at that point. So now that we have realized that small steps in a direction is not going to necessarily change. So the inactive functions would remain inactive uh, if you take small steps in any direction. I'm going to use that idea to rewrite this f of x plus d plus c px plus d as f of x plus c p x plus theta c x d plus small o of d where theta c is defined as max j in 0 to r gradient fx transpose d plus gradient gj x transpose d oh c there is a c here <coughs> Yes. Uh, R is less than N. M. M. Uh, M. No, R could be any number. So if you have M inequality, if you have M inequalities, so then you have M plus M plus R. So the R that you see here is number two multiplied by number of equality plus number of inequality. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, this R is different because here I'm including all these inequality constraints too. Uh, sorry, equality constraints too. Okay, any other question? All right, so what we have done is we needed an expansion of fx plus d plus cpx plus d and we kind of realized and argued that if you take small enough direction d along any direction at x, uh, the constraints that are not active will remain not active 
But what do you mean by active constraints? Well, gj of x should be equal to p of x. So gj should drive the penalty function at that particular point. So we denoted the set of all j which are active at that particular point. And then uh, if you take this maximum operation over all such j's, uh, you will realize that only the ones that are maximum at that particular point x and in the direction d, only the points that affect this maximum value will actually affect the, the first order expansion around uh, x. Okay? And then rest of the terms are all going to be very small in comparison to other terms. So this is the first order, sorry, this is the zeroth order Taylor expansion, this is the first order Taylor expansion, and this is the higher order Taylor expansion which we are going to ignore. Uh, shortly. Now in almost all situations uh, that we have studied so far, we want to minimize, uh, let's say we want to find direction d such that fx plus d is minimum, and we rewrite it as minimum gradient fx transpose d plus half d transpose hd, where d is in Rn, okay, where h is some positive definite matrix. So if I want to find the direction d at which the function is minimized, we instead consider the first order Taylor expansion plus some positive definite term, uh, and find an appropriate value of d which satisfies, solves this equation, and that dk, so, or that d star, would be a valid descent direction for this particular problem. Okay, and we have done this several times in this class. And we are going to do the same thing in this particular example. In particular, if I want to find a descent direction for uh, minimizing the function fx plus cpx, I'm going to look at the first order expansion, and what I need to do is minimize this particular first order term, right? So that's the first order term here. Okay, so we put this first order term here. Uh, the second order term can be picked according to any positive definite matrix H, and we find the minimum value of D here. And I'm going to do the same thing and minimize, uh, find the minimum value of D such that this particular term is minimized, uh, plus some half D transpose HD term. Uh, but this is, again, a problematic situation because I have max of certain functions. So let's see how to deal with that. Okay, so I guess the main idea is clear. This is something we have used several times. We are going to do the same thing for this problem, even though it's not differentiable. Okay, so this is my idea. Applying the idea. I want to minimize over all D in Rn max of this is J in capital Jx, sorry, C. oh yeah, C of course, yes, I do need a C here, yeah, okay.
Yeah. yeah, it should be argument. Wow, you guys have become really good. <laughs> okay, yeah, that D star should be argument. Uh, so now I have min of max of certain functions. Uh, again, something that's complicated, uh, but I think that can be handled. So, so here is a, 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 an idea which I'm going to use to simplify that particular function. I want to find min of f1 x, no, min over x, max over f1 x and f2 of x. I'm claiming that this problem is equivalent to solving the following problem. I want to minimize over x and c of c such that f1 of x less than or equal to c and f2 of x less than or equal to c. It's just a scalar quantity. So x is an Rn, c is an R. So it's not a constant, it's just a variable of optimization. Okay, let's see why this should be true. Let's solve an even simpler problem. Uh, max of a comma b can be written as min of min over c such that a is less than or equal to c and b is less than or equal to c. So in particular, this is an optimization problem, and I want you to convince yourself that this optimization problem is the same as max, the solution to this optimization problem is the same as max of A comma B. Is that clear or? Let's look at this, uh, this problem, the optimization problem on the right, uh, and assume that A is less than B. What is max of AB? B. Now let's look at this constraint. Is B going to satisfy A less than or equal to B? Yes. And B less than or equal to B? Right. Yes. So uh, C equal to B is a possible solution. Um, if I pick a value of C which is strictly less than B, then this constraint will be invalid. So C must be, the C star must be greater than B. So in fact, Okay, let me write the argument. So A is less than B, assume. So C star must be greater than or equal to B. And C star is equal to B satisfies the constraints. Okay, so therefore, C star is equal to B, and and uh, this is the same as max of A comma B, where A comma B, A, A and B are all real numbers here in this case. Okay. Any questions so far on this problem? I think this is pretty simple. It requires a little bit of thought, but after that you can convince yourself that th the solution to this optimization problem is exactly this. Now I'm going to apply it here. Uh, 
So max of f1, so replace a by f1 of x and b by f2 of x. So I have max of f1 of x comma f2 of x is min of c, uh, f1 of x less than equal to c and f2 of x less than equal to c. And then I want to put a min over x on this side. So I put min over x on this side and I get this expression, this uh, optimization problem. So let me use that idea on this side to say that this is argmin d in rn c in r gradient of fx transpose d plus half d transpose hd plus c c such that gradient of gjx transpose d plus gjx less than equal to c. And this is for all j 0 to r. Okay, And the reason why I could include all other constraints in this situation is because this term for j not in j of x would be strictly negative and therefore uh, it won't participate in this optimization problem for small values of d. Okay. One thing I want to notice is remember that g0 of x is equal to 0. So g0 of x is equal to 0, the gradient is 0. So the optimal value c star here would always be uh, greater than or equal to 0. Okay. Because by definition our gj is equal to 0. So yeah. Why don't we have j in capital J? Yeah. So, um, Uh, remember I had drawn this curve, right? So in this case, uh, this is my g plus gradient of g trans or g3 plus gradient of g3 transpose d. Uh, this one would be g2 plus gradient of g2 transpose d. And this would be g1 plus gradient of g1 transpose t. So at this particular point, these two uh, curves are adding to the penalty function. This curve is not adding to the penalty function, uh, which means that g1 plus d transpose gradient of g1 is going to be strictly less than 0. Okay? It will not affect the penalty function at all uh, for small values of d. Okay, so this c by definition is greater than or equal to zero. So I can remove, I can put this constraint, knowing well that this constraint will not be active in the optimization problem at all, and therefore will not participate in the optimization problem. Um, but it wouldn't matter if you replace this with j in j x. But you then you need to know which constraints are active at every point in the space, 
which may require some more computation. Okay. Any other question? Yes. This problem is still not differentiable, right? No, now this problem is, I mean, you can solve this problem because it's a quadratic problem with linear constraints. So uh, we are saying that the new variable that we introduced. Yes. Uh, uh, what do you mean by variable? Variable cannot be differentiable. Variable is a variable. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the objective function is differentiable in x as well as c. And the constraints are all linear. So this is some matrix transpose d plus some constant less than or equal to the, another variable. So it's like we are evaluating the uh, constraint which has the lowest value of c, right? You are evaluating the constraints at? Yes, or not the lowest value, maximum value. Yeah. Maximum. Okay. Um, so we started with a complicated optimization problem with uh, equality constraints and inequality constraints. We transformed it into an optimization problem with all inequality constraints for notational simplicity. And then we went through a series of steps and found that every point x, the descent direction d star would satisfy. Uh, so no, at every point x, if you figured out d star by solving this optimization problem, um, then it would be a descent direction and you can actually take a step in that direction and you will reduce the value of the function. Uh, assuming that you get a valid d star which is non-zero, okay? Um, one question you might ask is we started with an optimization problem, we ended up with solving another optimization problem at every point of time, but the point in these cases is that this optimization problem is much easier to solve in comparison to the original optimization problem we started with, okay? Because it's a quadratic program with linear inequality constraints, so much easier to solve. You can use simplex method, a manifold sub-optimization method to solve this particular problem. Okay, <clears throat> there is still a problem with this expression, with, this, with solving this optimization problem. What's the problem? There's something we still don't know about in, in that particular optimization problem. C, right? Yeah, so we don't know this term, right? Remember, we required C to be sufficiently large and C was supposed to be greater than the sum of all Lagrange multipliers. Now the question is, I am standing at X naught and I need to pick, I need to solve for D star and I don't know what value of C I should pick. Should it be five, should it be 10, should it be one million, should it be one billion, I just don't know. So what do you think should we do as a first step? No thoughts? Okay. So we want to find C greater than summation of mu j star j equals 1 to r. So here is an idea. At time t equals to zero, I'm standing at x zero. I'm going to solve for d zero star, or let, let me put tilde here, d zero tilde star such that argument plus zero such that gradient of gj trans x0 transpose
okay so i don't know the value of c um, so i just pick 0 here 0 0 here solve this problem and once i solve this problem i'll get lagrange multiplier corresponding to this inequality constraint let me denote it by we've used lambda mu let me denote it by nu 0 nu 0 star then i pick a value of c or c1 equals to 1 transpose nu 0 star plus gamma where gamma is some value greater than 0 and then i solve oh i need to pick alpha as well right so i pick x1 equals to x0 plus alpha0 d0 alpha0 comes from armijo's rule minimization rule or limited minimization rule okay and i get d1 star by solving the same optimization problem now c1 is used instead of c in the optimization problem okay so it helps you initialize the value of c and then you have to update ck ck is equal to min ck minus 1 1 transpose nu k minus 1 star plus gamma okay so finally we have a nice algorithm which we could apply to solve optimization problems of this type. The important aspect of this optimization problem is you start with a complicated nonlinear optimization problem with nonlinear constraints. You transform it into a sequence of quadratic programs that you need to solve. And you solve these sequence of quadratic programs, pick you get the value of d naught star and you pick alpha naught according to some Armijo's rule or limited minimization rule or minimization rule and then you get at x1 solve another quadratic program with an updated value of c1 um, and then continue solving this quadratic program sequentially in order to arrive at an optimal solution to not an op I shouldn't say optimal solution in order to arrive at a stationary solution to the optimization problem that wants to minimize this expression and hopefully whatever point x star you converse to after running this iteration for many many times hopefully that prob that point would be a first order necessary condition which satisfies the first order necessary condition for optimality for the original problem you started with uh, which has been deleted so that's why this algorithm is known as sequential quadratic program for solving, uh, for solving the constrained optimization problem. Okay, so this was the problem we started with. 
We convert it into a sequence of quadratic programs. Uh, we pick the sequence xk equals to xk minus 1 plus alpha k minus 1 dk minus 1 star. Update the value of ck, solve the quadratic optimization problem again. And if your solution converges, if xk converges to x bar, then theta c uh, ck converges to c bar, then theta c bar x bar d is equal to 0. So if your xk converges to x bar, ck converges to c bar, then theta c bar x bar comma d is equal to 0 for all d. Well, it's greater than or equal to 0 for all d in Rn. Okay, and remember this was the first order feasible, first order variation of fx plus d plus cpx plus d. Okay, yes. Um, this still doesn't mean the c bar is big enough. Um, so, this, if you run this iteration and assuming that ck converges, that will definitely be much higher than the um, much higher than the Lagrange multipliers for the problem that you started with. Okay, yeah. Uh, it, so for that ck, it's ck minus one and also new k minus one, or is it? So this is uh, the Lagrange multiplier corresponding to these constraints. Uh, so you sum them up and then plus some positive number gamma. So you look at this expression, uh, look at this number, look at this number, pick the, oh, this should be, sorry, this should be max. Yeah, this should be the maximum of the two numbers. Okay, so that's why CK would always be increasing. It will never decrease. Sorry, that should have been a max. Okay. Yes, so if xk converges to uh, the point x star, which is the solution to this optimization problem, then nu k would be very close to, or rather the sum of nu k minus one, so sum of this uh, nu star would be very close to the sum of absolute value of Lagrange multipliers for the original problem. So you will always make sure that c is larger than the sum of Lagrange multipliers because of this term gamma greater than zero. Okay, so that's all I have for sequential quadratic program. Uh, in the next class, we'll talk about Banach contraction mapping theorem, which is one of the most fundamental theorem in analysis. And we'll see how it applies to proving convergence for optimization algorithms. Thank you. Yes. Could you just remind me again how we get the Lagrange multiplier out of this? So this is a